All right, I've succeeded in staring you down into silence. Hey, we, we've really saved uh, the best for last, an extraordinary speaker. Uh, we've got uh, Robert Kaplan here uh, as our final keynote speaker. He's recognized, obviously, as one of the world's leading thinkers and writers on global affairs, and in fact, has twice made the list of Foreign Policy Magazine's top 100 global thinkers. He's a senior fellow at the Center for New American Security and a senior advisor at Eurasia Group. He's a best-selling author of 17 books, all of which are currently in print. His latest book is Earning the Rockies, How Geography Shapes America's Role in the World. He's been an extraordinary guest at the War College, and we're honored to have him here as our final keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And again, it's a great honor to be back at the War College for the Strategy Forum. And what I'd like to do is give you um, a tour of the world uh, in about 35, 40 minutes. Um, and I'm sure there are areas I won't get to, and you can raise them in the Q&A afterwards. First of all, let me start at 30,000 feet and then get down to ground level. Technology is not defeating geography. What's happened is that technology has shrunk geography and made it smaller so that the world is more anxious, more claustrophobic, more tied together than ever before. But it's like my wristwatch. It may be small. And you have even smaller watches. But to understand it, you have to take it apart to see all the, weir the wheels and gears and, you know, and, and everything that makes it tick. And that's why river systems, <coughs> ports, uh, mountain ranges, uh, et cetera, are more important now than they've ever been, precisely because the world is more integrated and smaller. Globalization means integration. But integration means more points of interconnection. And the more points there are of interconnection, the more possibility for military and other kinds of flare-ups. So it's precisely because of globalization and because of integration that the world today is more anxious and claustrophobic than it's ever been in its history. Because every place matters in a way that it didn't. Uh, if you just pluck one string somewhere, the whole web vibrates. The whole strategic uh, web of the world vibrates. You know, people talk about short, sharp wars in the South China Sea. I don't believe it. Because precisely because of connectivity, wars and conflicts have, a, have a, a means to migrate to other regions in a way that they never had before. So that the conflicts or the rivalries in the Baltic Sea Basin, the Black Sea Basin, the East and South China Seas are more interrelated than ever, one could ever have imagined a few decades ago. Um, you can, eat, in fact, the word Eurasia has a meaning in the way that it didn't a decade ago. A decade ago, it was just a geographic term for the supercontinent. But now we have a cohering Eurasian conflict system that never existed before. Um, and now, let me go lower into, into details, but let me just give you one example of what I mean. Take India and China, for instance. India and China, for most of history, were two great world civilizations that really did not have much to do with each other. They were separated by the high wall of the Himalayas. Yes, Buddhism spread from the Indian subcontinent into what is today China in Middle Antiquity. And yes, the Opium Wars brought the two, par the two parts of Asia together in a conflict system. But those were aberrations. Th those were exceptions to the rule. But because of the way that techno military technology has defeated distance, we now have an Indian intercontinental ballistic missile system that can hit any city in China. You have Chinese fighter jets in Tibet 
that can include India in their arc of operations. You have Indian warships occasionally in the South China Sea. You have, South, you have Chinese warships through, uh, you know, more and more in the Indian Ocean. You have Chinese port building projects throughout the Indian Ocean in Myanmar, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, ta uh, Tanzania, et cetera. You have the Chinese building um, a, a military facility in Djibouti at the Straits of Bab el Mandeb, all of which are surrounding India. So it's precisely because of technology that a new geography of rivalry has been created between India and China that never existed before. Uh, so this is how technology enhances geography rather than defeats it. And I could play this out throughout the world in other examples. I just happen to use India and China. Uh, all right, let me go lower and, and talk about, I'm going to talk about the Middle East, Europe, and then finally Asia. All right, the Middle East. Why is there so much conflict? Why do we have failed states, semi-failed states? What's happening in our era that you don't read about in the newspapers? What's happening is that for the first time in modern history, the Middle East is in um, a post-imperial situation. Empire and imperialism may be dirty words in the current academic world, but in fact, most of human history, human beings have been governed by one empire or another. Um, the British, the European empires were merely the top slither of an imperial system, a, a tradition that goes back to dozens of Chinese empires, I Iranian empires, Indian empires, even African empires. A uh, hundred years ago, in 1918, the Ottoman Turkish Empire collapsed in the Middle East. Um, so that was one imperial system gone. Um, for, uh, during, the, during the Ottoman rule, you might have had instability, wars, but, one, but you didn't have the fight and the argument over territory between Sunnis and Shiites and Arabs and Jews in Palestine because everyone owed fealty and sovereignty to the Sultan. You know, everyone's political boss was ultimately the Turkish Sultan in Constantinople. That's gone. It went away in 1918. And if you ask me, the Middle East 100 years later has still not found a solution to the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Um, then you have... Um, the British and French imperial mandate systems, uh, which, which governed, may not have governed fairly or nicely, but they governed what is today the Levant, what is today greater Syria and greater Iraq. That disappeared at the, at, you know, in the years following World War II. Then you had the rule of what I call post-imperial strongmen. Uh, people like Gaddafi in, in Libya, uh, the Assad family in Syria, uh, the string of Iraqi military dictators that, that started in 1958 that only culminated in Saddam Hus with Saddam Hussein in the late 1970s. Well, who are these people? Why do I call them post-imperial? Because they governed according to, uh, to, to borders that were drawn up by the European colonialists that often were averse to ethnic and sectarian boundaries, and therefore they had to invent new sec uh, secular forms of state identity uh, in order to govern. Uh, and they governed. May not have been nice, but they governed. Um, and they're all gone, or mostly gone. Then you had the American system, which is the British Oxford scholar John Darwin calls a, a, an, an, an imper, imperialism in all but name. In other words, uh, the American, no American official will ever use the word imperial system to define what we are in the world, but that doesn't mean it doesn't really exist. Um, if you look at the... At the, at the frustrations, challenges of, Amer of, of, of American foreign policy, of the breadth of our deployments and installations around the world, <clears throat> of our economic and diplomatic throw weight, we, we can only be compared with former empires because they're the, we are in an imperial-like situation even though a, a U.S. official would be fired if he ever used that term. 
um, <clears throat> that's disappearing. Uh, and when I say disappearing, uh, what it means, it means a number of things. It means that we cannot fix complex Islamic societies on the ground. Um, it means that the, the American military can save face in Afghanistan, but it can never win in Afghanistan. Um, it means that, um, it's un, that while America was a successful, well-functioning uh, democracy in the print and typewriter age, it doesn't mean that that's going to continue in the digital and video era. It's still up in the air. Remember, the Industrial Revolution happened in the mid-late 19th century, but we only saw its effect in war in 1914. The, uh, the, the digital video revolution happened in the mid-late 20th century, but we only demonstrably saw its effect on politics in 2016. In other words, there's a lag time before a technological revolution has an effect in military or politics in a big way. So we're in a new era, and it's unclear that the United States can, you know, can project power the way it did in the Middle East in the past. And we can go into lots of details on this, on the, 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 the Saudi-Qatari split, all of that. Let me move on to Europe, because in Europe, we're also seeing the erosion of an imperial system. Um, the European Union is like the Holy Roman Empire in, in, in its later phases. It's not disappearing. It's not going to go away. It may even revitalize. But it, it's going to share influence and impact with other things going forward. Um, the European Union is um, it, it's imperial because it governs from far away Brussels, yet, 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 you know, but essentially influences daily life in Greece, in Bulgaria, and other places at the other end of Europe. It's only partially democratic. It's elitist. It's heavily bureau bureaucratic. It's what I call the necessary empire. And it's necessary because only the European Union has the possibility of calming the, the still troubled Balkans and many and other parts of Europe. Uh, places like Hungary and Poland have no future without the European Union, essentially, though their leaders may say something different now. Uh, let me go around Europe and tell you my worries. Uh, we'll start with Russia. In the, during the Cold War, Russia had uh, the Soviet Union had several hundred thousand troops in the heart of Europe, in the heart of Germany. All right. Now, Russia has far fewer number of troops to the east of the Baltic states and the Kola Peninsula and place, places like that. But it, though the threat is not as demonstrable as it was, it's more ambiguous and subversive. Uh, remember, a leader like Putin or any other leader of Russia you can imagine knows that his country has been invaded by not just Hitler and Napoleon, but by Swedes, Lithuanians, Poles, Teutonic Knights, etc. And therefore, Russia requires a soft, traditional zone of imperial influence throughout Central Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, to prevent that happening again. So that <clears throat> What Russia is doing is it's buying media through third parties. It's buying off corrupt politicians. It's you know it's running information warfare. It's you know hacking, um, using you know gas pipeline influence. Um, it's doing a number of things which are all subversive, all infinitely deniable, all intended to buy Russian influence in Central Eastern Europe and to weaken those states, essentially. Um, and the states are very weak in many cases because what is the, why is the European Union, remember, is weak, is, is troubled because it's so ambitious. And why is it so ambitious? It's ambitious 
because it seeks to govern from Brussels, the former Carolinian Empire, Prussian Empire, Habsburg, Austrian Empire, Byzantine and Turkish empires. Those aren't just names. Those, those indicate different patterns of development and culture. It's not an accident that the weakest countries in the European Union are in the Ottoman Byzantine um, uh, um, uh, area in the southeast. Um, if you look at the Balkans today, the war in the former Yugoslavia has continued in every way except in the shooting. Um, uh, R Romania, Croatia, Slovenia are the relative success stories. The rest of the former Yugoslavia, as well as Greece, as well as Bulgaria, are either semi-failed states, failed states, or states going nowhere. Uh, and this is all the former uh, Byzantine Turkish part of Europe, and only the EU has the power to bring real stability to the region. But meanwhile, the Russians and the Turks are, are, are ceding influence into this area, and the only country with the power to stop the Russian-Turkish march is Germany. Um, and the question about Germany is this that I raise. The most influential, in terms of leaving a legacy, ruler of Germany in the 20th century was not Adolf Hitler, it was Konrad Adenauer. Um, Adenauer, who was chancellor of Germany from the late 40s throughout the 1950s uh, for a long time, basically invented the pattern of German rule since the mid-20th century. Every German chancellor since Adenauer, of the center right or the center left, has followed the Adenauer mold in terms of no experiments, a, a conservative bourgeoisie society, uh, a deep felt moral and historical legacy to, the, to what happened in World War II and to being a member of the West in the Cold War. Angela Merkel is the latest in that line. But my question is, will future German leaders follow in the Adenauer mold? Or is Merkel the last or the next to the last German leader who will be an Adenauer-like chancellor? Um, and that's the question, because World War II is 75, three quarters of a century away. Time moves on. A resurgence of German nationalism would not be provocative. It would be natural. And it could take all kinds of forms, more isolationism, more, uh, uh, you know, a separate deal with Russia, uh, you name it. So that Europe is... Don't take European security for granted, in other words. Um, and the American, um, you know, the liberal democratic order that America, the liberal, the, the, the project of liberal world order that America has pursued in a leadership role in both Europe and Asia may be coming to an end. Um, uh, and because of changes in American society itself. Let me move on to Asia, where again, you have this question about the continuation of the American-led order. Uh, why are we reading so much about, about the South China Sea, the East China Sea? Why is this in the news so much? Because these territorial disputes, in some cases, go back centuries. Why now? Again, there's a deep underlying reason. Asia is the opposite of the Middle East. Instead of weak or failed states, you have strong states. Throughout the Cold War, and Asian countries were internally focused. Uh, Mao Zedong was internally focused in uniting China through revolutionary upheaval. And then Deng Xiaoping was internally focused in uniting and strengthening China through pseudo-capitalist development. Uh, you know, Mao united China at great human cost, and, and, and Deng made China economically consequential in the world. Um, but the truth is that three decades of, you know, of double-digit economic growth does not lead to peace and freedom. It leads to military acquisitions. So China has built a great navy and you know, ballistic missile system, air force, and it's done so for the same reasons the United States did so between the end of the Civil War and the outbreak of the Spanish-American War. It, um, 
America became rich. It, you know, it had double-digit economic growth rates for most of the years between 1865 and 1898. And thus, we had new trading relationships around the world, new security concerns, and a question of status entered into it. We felt we deserved a great military. China is following the same path. It, China is not a rogue state. It's, you know, it's developing militarily in a very, very normal way. Um, I, I, I would argue, to go with the world's second biggest economy. So China is now externally focused. Japan, which was more or less externally neutered because of its quasi-pacifism as a result of, of, of its bad experience with militarism in World War II, now has to be externally focused because it sees the, the Chinese military growth as an existential threat. And then you have Vietnam, which was internally focused throughout the Cold War, as we all know, in wars and upheavals. Now externally focused, you know, building up a navy, air force, etc. The same with what with what used to be called the Malay Peninsula, now Malaysia. Wars and rebellions throughout, you know, during phases of the Cold War. All these states, which were internally focused, have they're now at peace. They've been building infrastructures, bureaucracies. They've become strong. And what do they do? They acquire militaries. And they project power outwards. And that leads to disagreements about who controls what in what area of the South and East China Sea. It's a very normal historical pattern. Um, the conflicts and rivalries in the South and East China Seas represent the, the result of development, of economic development. The, you know, success stories don't lead to peace in world history. They lead to a new level of military rivalry. And that's what's happened. Um, you can talk to the Chinese all day about how, wh why they shouldn't be doing what they're doing in the South and East China Seas. And they will not be convinced because they should not be convinced. Because what they're doing in the South China Sea strategically is not much different than how we approach the greater Caribbean in the 19th and early 20th century. We needed the control of the Caribbean to unlock the Western Hemisphere strategically for us. Um, and with that, we had power to spare to affect the balance of power in the Eastern Hemisphere in the 20th century. And that's what the history of the 20th century was all about, America tipping the balance in two world wars and the Cold War. The Chinese need essential control or parity with us in the South and East China Seas because it unlocks for them the wider Pacific, much more importantly, the Indian Ocean, and it also allows them to soften up Taiwan even further because Taiwan is in the middle of the East and South China Seas. It makes perfect strategic sense. They're doing exactly what they should be doing, um, except that their geography is different from us. So they see things from a different geographical perspective. As one Chinese student said to me when I was in Beijing, he said, you Americans come from half a world away with your warships you know, into the South China Sea. That makes you hegemonic. While our warships in the South China Sea means we're merely in our adjacent waters that we should control. Um, that's, ha that's how they look at it. And, from the Chi and I would argue that the Chinese are already at war and they're winning in a way. War to the Chinese is, um, you know, it's political, it's military, and only in the last resort, I mean, it's political, it's economic, and only in the last resort is it military. And if it's military, it should proceed by micro steps, so you never have to fight. In other words, change the facts in the water or on the ground through steps so small that a reaction against those steps would seem like an overreaction. And that's essentially what they've been doing with their island building, everything. Let me talk for a minute or two about One Belt, One Road, what it really is, because it's connected to the South China Sea. One Belt, One Road, the new Silk Road, is a Chinese branding operation. 
Um, it's a branding operation for, in fact, what to a significant extent they've already done, and they've just given it a name, which is build roads, railways, pipelines throughout set former Soviet Central Asia to bring in oil and natural gas from former Soviet Central Asia into, into Western China so that China is less dependent on the narrow Strait of Malacca for its oil deliveries, uh, for its energy deliveries. It also provides China with an aspirational grand strategy, a direction, an intellectual direction. So they'll accomplish some things of the, of the one belt, one road. They may not accomplish others, but they have a grand strategy. They have a direction. All right, so it's partly a branding operation. Another thing it is, is China is very worried about the Muslim Turkic Uyghurs in Western China. The Uyghurs are a greater threat to China than the Tibetans are because the Tibetans, of course, already operate in the international system. They have a Dalai Lama who's used to speaking to international diplomats. Uh, the Tibetans can be negotiated with. They have a, a cosmopolitan elite of their own. But the Uyghurs are more of an inchoate force, something that can blow up the whole system from below, given an environmental emergency or something like that. So what the Chinese need to do is to surround the Uyghurs, and they're doing it with one belt, one road, because they don't want the Uyghurs to have a rear base in fellow Turkic, fellow Muslim, former Soviet Central Asia. And finally, um, why are the Chinese building such a great navy in the first place. So the question should be is, why do they have the luxury to do so? Given that, except for the early Ming dynasty, they don't have really that much of a maritime tradition, at least going deep into history. They're a continental power, you know, even though now they're a maritime power. But why can they do this? Because for the first time, or one of the few times in their history, they, they have security on land so that they have the luxury to go to sea. And one belt, one road provides them with more security on land. And, we'll, and I believe that what one belt, one road is also about is to link up in a very organic sense China and, and Iran to make an unbeatable combination because, uh, because the real the, the, the real tension in, in Eurasia that's rarely content, contemplated is China-Russia. Uh, uh, you know, China and Russia can be tactical allies. They cannot be strategic allies. Uh, the Chinese are beating the pants off the Russians in Central Asia. The Chinese have more money to throw around. Uh, the Russians can't have a formal alliance with China, I don't believe, because Putin would be the junior partner in such an alliance, and he couldn't tolerate that. So there are limits to Chinese-Russian cooperation. Let me just sum up with a few points here. Um, I would say that we live in a world where all the great powers are in an absolute sense declining. I think the U.S. is declining in, you know, in the sense of its political system. We have, you know, we have a partisan dysfunction in Congress that we have not seen since, or since 19th century frontier days. As I said, I'm not convinced that the digital video era will be as kindly to American democracy as the print and typewriter era was. Um, it's unclear that we will continue to provide leadership to the degree that we have in, you know, in, in former decades. I think in terms of Russia, Russia could in the future be a low calorie version of, you, of the former Yugoslavia. Uh, you know, it's, it's internal cohesion is at risk. There is no clear succession process for Putin. Uh, the Chinese are obviously stronger than Russia, much stronger. But now I go back to Samuel Huntington's book of 1968, Political Order and Changing Societies, where he essentially says the more, the more, uh, the more vibrant, the more economically developed, the more a, a country becomes, the more complex its society becomes. And the more complex its society becomes, the harder it is to satisfy that society. So that precisely because of the way China's developing, 
it's unclear that its current dynasty, because the Communist Party of China is merely the latest in a series of Chinese dynasties, going back to antiquity, um, whether, whether, whether the party can hold on in the 2020s. So there are real question marks for China, Russia, the United States, and I would say for Europe as well, for the European Union as well. So who's benefiting? Well, I don't see anyone is. I think we may be entering a period of history which I call an age of comparative anarchy, which means more anarchy than during the Cold War or in the immediate post-Cold War era. It means powers which are not necessarily strengthening uh, in a relative sense. Uh, we also are entering a kind of a geopolitical recession uh, of sorts because if the U.S. provides less coherent, dependable, predictable leadership than in the past, you have the rise of, of, of regional bullies, you have a decline in global public goods, such as free trade pacts, fighting climate change, you know, things like that. Um, so that... Um, so, you know, so that's how I would put it. I would say that the, um, the, uh, the biggest question I have for the world, if you could narrow it down to one specific question, which of course you can't, but think of it like a quiz show uh, in a way, um, I would say is what happens to China in the, in the next, over the next decade or next 15 years? Because I know that the Pentagon, the U.S. military establishment is all focused on the Chinese threat to a greater extent, to the Russian threat on a, on a somewhat lesser extent. Um, and they do this because this is what bureaucracies do. You know, they have, they have a goal. You know, they have, here's our enemy. Here's what we need to do. And if the enemy does not materialize, we've still learned so much along the way of trying to combat it that, you know, it works. But I'm not 100% uh, convinced of this. I think we may see a much weaker China in the 2020s precisely because of economic and political and, and intellectual development in China. I think we may see a much weaker Russia uh, in, the 2020, in the 2020s. Um, but weaker can be an ironic phrase. The reason is because all, sometimes the weaker a state gets internally, the more aggressive it gets externally. Because external aggression is a way to kind of gather in a nationalistic impulse which can stabilize a society that's getting weaker internally. But then the question becomes, to what level does it internally weaken? Because if it internally weakens catastrophically, then it's less able to project power externally. But if it internally weakens only moderately, it could become much, more, much, much more aggressive externally. And I think that's what we're starting to see now with the Russians, with the Chinese. We're starting to see the implicit, the implicit external results of not weakening but more complexity and tension in governing Russia and China. Because remember, Russia and China are the two places on which the whole organizing principle of Eurasia hinges. And to governing Russia and China is getting harder to do. It's not getting easier to do. Um, and therefore, um, nationalism is a weapon in the hands of the leaders um, that, they, that they can use in this regard. Let me, uh, you know, the whole Washington foreign policy establishment is tied up with how do we combat China and Russia? You know, how do we fight a war in the South China Sea? How do we fight a war in the Baltic Sea Basin or in the Black Sea Basin? Um, and, and wouldn't it be better if we had different leaders than Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping? Um, I, I disagree with this. Um, I think Xi and Putin are as good as you can get in Russia and China. Um, I think anything that follows Putin, while initially maybe more hopeful and liberal, 
will eventually be far more chaotic. And remember, Russia still has the ability to destroy the United States in 30 minutes, given its nuclear arsenal. I think after Putin is either more chaos, more nationalism, the chances of it moving in a liberal democratic direction are there, they exist, but they're less likely than the other two possibilities, I said. I think what Xi Jinping is doing in China makes perfect sense. He's centralizing power, building a personality cult around himself so that the, he can therefore decentralize at the provincial level to allow economic reform. Xi, every morning, I'm convinced, says to himself, how can I always do the opposite of what Gorbachev did? Uh, you know, don't liberalize at the top. Don't listen to the West, to the Americans. They don't know anything about, you know, about this system. You know, the only way to, to economically reform China is first through more central control, not through less central control. So, uh, you know, to that extent, China remains predictable. Anything beyond Xi may be very unpredictable. So that's what I leave you with. Uh, it's not a pretty picture, um, because as I said at the beginning, technology and the defeat of distance through, techn through technology has made, has made geopolitics more fraught, more anxious, more claustrophobic than ever before. Thank you very much. Thank you. And questions? Uh, where? Yes, yes. If I can push the button. If you uh, view China as a country with an awful lot of people and very little in the way of natural resources, and within view, another country with very few people and a lot of natural resources, wouldn't you think that China would be looking at very hungry eyes at moving across the border into Russia? Uh, by Russia, you mean the Russian Far East? Russian Siberia, yeah. Yeah, all right. Yeah, Siberia is to the west of the Russian Far East, actually. In other words, over, you know, over the, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it means Chinese Manchuria has, a, has 100 million people thereabouts. The Russian Far East has about 7 million people, and its, and its population is declining. And the Russian Far East is rich in timber, in gold, in all kinds of resources. The Russians, I think, are slowly becoming terrified uh, of a Chinese demographic imperialism um, in, you know, into China. Um, I think that uh, the Chinese have economically, in a way, dominated Outer Mongolia, which was part of former Chinese dynasties. Uh, they've taken back Macau and Hong Kong. They continue to soften up Taiwan, you know, which is a decade-long process, because the Chinese goal is to win and extend your territory without ever having to fight. Uh, you know, because uh, simply by having to fight means you made a miscalculation somewhere along the line. Um, and um, so I think that's a real, you know, that's a real threat that the Russians face. Um, let me just say a word about North Korea, because I didn't mention it in my talk. You know, it may preclude a question, which is don't think of North Korea as a communist state. Think of it as a national fascist state like Ceausescu's Romania in the 1980s, in the sense that, you know, that, the, that a real enemy is Japan for the, for the Koreans, because Japan ruled the Korean Peninsula for 35 years from 1910 to 1945, often in a very brutal way. So that Japan is as much a threat to North Korea uh, you know, or rather, North Korea is as much a threat uh, to Japan as, as North Korea is a threat to South Korea. And maybe we'll, let's go back to questions. Yes. Colonel Justin Sapp, I'm a student here, sir. Um, I, I very much enjoyed your book several years ago, Imperial Grunts. And as a Special Forces officer, I was kind of wondering, as you look to the future, 
What do you see as the appropriate role for U.S. land power beyond counterinsurgency, especially for SOF, infantry, and, and the Marine Corps? All right, uh, it's a very good question. Um, what I see is that states in Eurasia are either weakening or not getting stronger. We've seen the collapse of states in, in greater Syria and greater Iraq. Um, Iran and Turkey are much stronger because they represent age-old imperial systems. Um, and, and they're much more coherent with their geography than Syria and Iraq. But they're not strengthening as states. They have enormous problems internally. We don't know what the future of former Soviet Central Asia will be. A number of those states have leadership transitions um, up ahead. Um, so we're going to face more and more, I think, instability in Eurasia and other areas of the world. Where we're, we're going to have to be comfortable, where we're going to, we're not, where, where there are going to, there are going to be very few um, opportunities for large-scale interventions, but perhaps more opportunities for interventions at the battalion level and below, or something like that. And where we may have to intervene in a low-level, off-the-headlines way of, of aiding proxy forces, because we won't want to get involved directly, to, uh, directly ourselves. Um, so I think that the future of SOF, Special Operations Forces, is very good uh, in that sense. That, uh, you know, that the opportunities um, uh, for intervention will exist more at the small, uh, more in the, in the lower scale than in the large scale uh, manner. Yes. Good day, sir. Thank you for your lecture. Lieutenant Scalene from Croatian Navy. I have a question about Balkan. Uh, like you said, many countries in Balkan are still instable. We know that Daytona, which mean reason was to buy time to solve the problem in Bosnia and Herzegovina, didn't really succeed. So how you see attending those issues from European Union, as we know that European Union, especially Germany, is very dependent on Russian uh, gas, oil, and how they can avoid the trap of uh, Russian influence in the area. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> as I said, uh, Romania and Croatia and Slovenia were the strong suits in the Balkans. Um, I would say that um, that Russia, Russia is able to weaken the Balkans very cheaply. Um, you, you know, it doesn't cost them much money to, un uh, to undermine uh, democratic systems there, to the degree that they even exist. Um, I think that, um, that, the, uh, that the Balkans are historically a zone of, Balkan, uh, of Russian influence. I think the, an unstated reason why we were able to be successful in the former Yugoslavia and two interventions was because it happened to come at a time of unusual weak Russian influence. When Russia was in the, it was in the post-Cold War chaos of Boris Yeltsin's regime and could not project power so that we could do whatever we wanted in the former Yugoslavia. That doesn't exist anymore. I think the only way to keep the Russians' uh, influence in, in southeastern Europe at a minimum is, number one, a strong Germany that's you know, moderate politically, which exists now. I would say the German political system, you could make an argument now, is healthier than the American political system, healthier than the British political system. Um, whether that will continue, that's another matter. A strong Germany, and more importantly, a strong European Union. Because, because if, if both Albania and 
Kosovo and Serbia can get into the European Union, then they no longer have disagreements with each other because they're all part of a larger imperial entity, the same way Middle Easterners were part of the Ottoman Turkish Empire. You know, you know that's how, there is no solution outside of the European Union for the Balkans, I would argue. And the European Union and Germany are tied together. Um, in this respect, because Germany is really the engine behind the European Union. Germany and France, you know, true, both countries, but a little bit more Germany than France. Um, so I think a strong Germany that helps revitalize the EU, I think there's reasons to hope because the elections in France went very well. I, it looks like the elections in Germany in the fall will go very well. Uh, so I think that's the key. Germany plus the EU keeps the Russians weak in the Balkans. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Um, <clears throat> look, the Americans with everything they're doing, two, two carrier strike groups near North Korea, or is it three for a few days, then one is coming home. Uh, our bombers in Guam. What all this is is, to, you know, Every threat we make or every statement of force we make regarding North Korea means to send a message to China saying, help us out here, you know, do something. Um, I'm skeptical that this will work. I'm a bit skeptical because the Chinese have more skin in the game than we do. The Chinese have a land border with North Korea. Uh, they're afraid to to experiment with the North Korean regime because it could lead to an implosion of the North Korean regime, which could lead to millions of refugees coming from North Korea across the Yalu and Tuman rivers into, uh, uh, into, in, into China itself. So also, China, China would much rather have um, uh, a kind of, um, you know, reformed communist regime, reformed authoritarian regime in North Korea, like China itself. But bringing that about is very difficult. And just because the Chinese have more influence in North Korea than we do, or anyone else does, does not mean that China can still influence, you know, you know issues of the North Korean regime that that regime considers for its very survival. So China may not be able to, may not be willing, may be hesitant to undermine the North Korean regime. The Chinese are terrified that a collapse of the state or a weakening of the state would lead to not only refugees, but also to an eventual greater Korea, democratic and free, governed from Seoul, that you know, that's not good for China. We can argue to China that it's good for them, but it isn't. What's better for China is the current situation with all of its problems, uh, with all of its difficulties, provided that there is no use of nuclear weapons. And this gets me to Libya, because when we toppled Gaddafi, we made it that much harder to convince the North Korean regime to give up their nuclear weapons. Because Gaddafi had given up his WMD program, he had been cooperating at us, with us on an intelligence level, um, and what did we do? At the first hint of, uh, of uprisings against him, we emotionally sided with the, dem with the demonstrators, and we eventually created the conditions for his violent murder. For his, for his violent murder. The North Koreans look at this and say, no, no. The only thing that protects our regime is nuclear weapons, you know, especially after Libya. Um, so I think it's, it's very hard. I mean, it's a good policy to ratchet up military pressure to try to convince the Chinese. Um, I'm worried of a trade-off. I don't think we should trade Taiwan for North Korea in any sense of the word. I don't believe that we should say to the Chinese diplomatically, you know, you know, indirectly, that significant help on North Korea will make some concessions on Taiwan because, uh, the ch because that would be selling out not only an ally, but Taiwan is the poster child of a successful democracy in the developing world. And, and, and so it's, it, it, it's an iconic state in the world for what we represent in the world. 
and, and, um, and no Chinese um, reassurances on Taiwan that they would give us would be believable, you know, uh, over time. Sorry. Yes, one more question, yes. Sir, um, thank you for your lecture. Um, regarding your comments about Ira Iranian-Chinese alliance, could you expound more on that? What evidence do you see of the nexus developing between Iran and China? Um, Iran has had a problem. I didn't speak much about Iran in my talk, I'm sorry. I would say that, think of Iran, Iranians have a civilizational sense of themselves that only the Chinese and the Indians have. In other words, it's a real civilization that coheres with a state. Iran is eternal. It was always there. It will always be there. Uh, uh, it's unclear that that's true for a, a number of states in the Arab world still. Um, Iran, though, is curiously lax prestige in former Soviet Central Asia. Um, and you would think it would because Iran is as much a Central Asian state as it is a Middle Eastern state. Iran's two oil producing zones are not only the Persian Gulf but the Caspian Sea. Iran is close to Ashgabat, the capital of Turkmenistan. I mean, it's just an hour or two away. Um, and yet Iran lacks certain prestige because the, this, this, the former Soviet Central Asians are turned off by Iran's religiosity. The, you know, Central Asia's former Soviet, uh, in, in, in all that that means, Soviet culture still permeates Central Asia in, a sense, in the sense that it's secular, it's, uh, you know, it's against any demonstrable show of religiosity. I think what, what China does for Iran and what Iran does for China is it gives them both more leverage in former Soviet Central Asia. Because Iran is at the western end of Central Asia and, and China is at the eastern end of Central Asia. So that, um, and if you think of the Tang Dynasty, other dynasties in Chinese history, if you Google the maps of these dynasties, you will see that a number of them had trade routes that went as far as the interior of Iran. So China building a bridge to Iran co coheres perfectly with Chinese history. Thank you very much. First, I'd like to uh, thank all of our speakers, our scholars, our academics. Thank you so much for making this Current Strategy Forum so extraordinary. We started off this Current Strategy Forum yesterday morning uh, with a video that talked about the extraordinary contributions of your U.S. Naval War College uh, to the nation, to the Navy, to the Joint Force and the contributions of the panelists here today, the keynote speakers, I know will have a, a long-lasting effect in terms of the dialogue that's so critical for our nation right now. That video was, of course, sponsored by the War College Foundation, and we have a special relationship with them uh, as somewhat of, a, of an alumni association, uh, but really just a, a group of, of generous supporters whose efforts provide a margin of excellence here. Uh, they underscore our capabilities uh, and uh, it, it, it directly enabled this conference, uh, which could not take place without our War College Foundation. Uh, finally, I say thank you to the students. This was for you. I hope this stretched your brain. I hope this uh, en enabled a bit more of the critical thinking skill set with which we are about to graduate here in, in uh, less than 48 hours now, unless I've lost track of time. Um, so congratulations to each one of you. I encourage uh, everyone here to pay it forward, uh, become a, a member of our War College Foundation or, or other institutions that support our great Navy, our joint force, uh, and our great nation. So uh, in fi final closing, I'll simply say, God bless us, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>